Welcome everyone to the November meeting of the Foxborough Historical Society. Uh, before we begin our meeting, I would ask you to join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. For all. Uh, before we begin our board meeting update, I would like to say a few words about the passing of Penny Ingram, who died on November 9th, age 99. Penny was a member of the Historical Society and served as president at one time. She was also a member of the Monday Club, active in her church, and an avid gardener. I would ask you to stand with me and just observe a moment of silence in Penny's memory. Thank you. So I'd have an update on this month's board meeting. Firstly, at our meeting on the 12th, the board presented Joan with a flower arrangement and a gift certificate to a local restaurant in recognition of her years of service to the society, most recently as president for four years. Many thanks, Joan. Next, we come to the vote to approve the revised bylaws. The updating of the bylaws involved many hours of work over many months by the board members and others, and I would like to thank all of them for their efforts. All members of the society were sent copies of the revised bylaws as comments, uh, for comments with a request that any inputs be uh, submitted by November 1st. As no comments were accepted, um, we will proceed with the approval process. Uh, do I have a motion to accept the bylaws as written? Anybody? Second. Second. Okay. Thank you. Society members will now vote on the motion to accept the bylaws. All those in favor of accepting the bylaws, please raise your hands. All those opposed? Okay. 20 voting in the affirmative, none in the negative. The motion to accept the bylaws is adopted. Well, thank you all very much. <coughs> At our board meeting, uh, one of our members suggested that one rather obvious way to attract new members would be to urge all of you to bring a friend along to the meetings. I'm sure that many of us can think of someone who has an interest in history and in Foxborough in particular. In the final analysis, members are the lifeblood of the society. Just in passing, we noted that the, Moose, the Morse House on North Street is still standing. But sadly, the, the prognosis is not good. Uh, just another reminder, it's time for our annual dues again. Please get them in as soon as possible if you have not already done so. That concludes the business portion of our meeting. I would now like to introduce our speaker this evening, Mr. Ron Hadley. Ron has spent over 30 years researching and chronicling the lives and fates of three of his ancestors, brothers who served in the Union Army in the Civil War, Hiram Streeter, Moses Streeter, and Joseph Streeter. It's hard for us to even begin to imagine the horror of the Civil War or to contemplate the loss of three brothers in the same family. With that said, I'll turn it over to Ron. Thank you, Jim. You, know? you can swap out. OK, thank you, Jim. It's a pleasure for me to be here tonight, uh, to be able to tell you about these three brothers from Whitingham, Vermont, and their parts in the Civil War. I grew up in Whitingham, Vermont, attended the schools there for 12 years and graduated from high school there. Then I went on to Northeastern, graduated from there, returned to Whitingham with my 
charming wife who's sitting right in the um, second row here. Uh, so I was one of the founders of their historical society in 1973 and the first president of that group. So I know what it's like to run an organization like this. Uh, 1991, however, I had to leave town to pursue employment in other parts of the country. And we moved to Norwood in 2002. I retired uh, four years ago so I can devote more time to uh, this avocation, if you will. So I'm a relative newcomer to the area, but I am a Morse descendant, uh, line of Joseph of Ipswich. I'm not sure which line the Morse house uh, <laughs> is from, probably Samuel of uh, Dedham, I'm thinking, which is Norwood and all of that. So it kind of ties together. They were uh, cousins. So uh, where is Whitingham, Vermont? Anybody ever hear of it no. besides my wife? OK. <laughs> Well, it sits right on the southern border. Uh, this is hopefully not going to get lost. You see this little yellow square right there, right about in the middle, just, uh, just outside of Massachusetts. I grew up two miles from Massachusetts. Uh, anybody ever hear of Rowe and Heath, Massachusetts? OK, so those are the two towns to the south of Whitingham. It's in the southwest corner of Wyndham County. And its neighbor to the west is the town of Reedsboro. And you can kind of see that way down the bottom of the other map here. We'll mention that one later. <coughs> About 20 miles from Greenfield, Mass. Whitingham was originally chartered in 1770 by the colony of New York at the time. And a lot of the early settlers were, came over from New Hampshire as well as some that were given grants by New York. So there was a little bit of conflict there any of you are familiar with that. Uh, later, other parts of the land, in order to clear up the titles, were chartered by the Republic of Vermont. Uh, prior to Vermont entering the Union in 1791, it was actually its own republic for 14 years, a separate independent country. Anybody that knew that before? <laughs> OK. So I was always interested in Whitingham history, and I devoured every book I could find on the subject. Thanks to my grandmother, Florence Page Morse, and many others, our family kept a number of original documents down through the generations, including some from my great-great-grandfather, Moses Streeter, the gentleman uh, in the middle of the uh, previous slide there. There we go. Moses in the middle. Who's he? Moses Streeter. To you. To you. My great-great-grandfather. Okay, one of the documents that was handed down was his journal and scrapbook. And in this, he wrote a number of original articles. You can still see some of them in his original hand. And sometimes he would get these things published in the newspaper and he'd stick the clipping on top of his original version. But he also wrote a number of newspaper articles and those are stuck in here throughout the book. He also was interested in literature and education and a number of different subjects. And if he found an interesting article, like people would do today, he pasted in there too. So it's, it's a mishmash of that sort of thing. <clears throat> so one of those articles described his capture and escape from the noted or notorious, depending on your side, uh, your point of view. John, are you back there? I certainly Yeah, John am. is back there. We'll, we'll talk about John later. <laughs> <laughs> he represents the site of the War of Northern Aggression, so that, that'll yeah, give you a clue, true. okay? Uh, this uh, noted or notorious person was Colonel John Singleton Mosby. I'll talk more about that later. Now, the article inspired me to learn more about Moses Streeter's service and about the Civil War in general. So there's a clipping that is in that book I showed you, uh, written by Moses Streeter. And he talks about uh, the fate of the three brothers. Three brothers enlisted from three different states and in blue uniform met on southern soil for the first time in years. When the 8th Vermont was wounded at the Battle of Cedar Creek, October 29th, 1864, which scars he will bear to the grave. Uh, the one in 57th Massachusetts was killed while fighting near Petersburg, June 17, 1864. 
The writer served through three years without a scratch. However, he was an ambulance driver. You can only imagine the horror that he saw uh, in all these battles. And I think uh, personally, without any real proof that he suffered from PTSD, uh, you can well imagine that, but they had no such uh, term in those days. So one winter evening in 1988, I was sitting there in my study at home up in Vermont, and I had a phone call from the curator of our historical museum up there, and she said, uh, do you know a Joseph Streeter? And I said, oh, let me look. So I looked through the family group sheets, and oh, that's my great-great-grandfather's brother. She says, I'll be right up. She came up, and she brought me this little diary from 1864 from Joseph Streeter. This is his whole account of his entire experience for that year in the Civil War. Wow. And we'll talk more about that later. So the diary inspired me to do more research, but there were a lot of time constraints at the time, and you know, it took a while to get this all done, like about another uh, 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> so let's put it in a little bit of perspective by giving you some Streeter family background. Uh, you've maybe seen the name Streeter here and there. Most of us are all related. Uh, there's about 3,000 or so in the U.S., all descended from one fellow, uh, Stephen Streeter, who was the first immigrant in our line, born in Tenderton, England in uh, 1594, arrived in Gloucester around 1635 to 1640 in that time frame, one of the first settlers of Gloucester. He married Ursula Adams, daughter of the immigrant Henry, Henry Adams, was also the ancestor of John, John Quincy, and that whole bunch. Family spread westward in Massachusetts in later generations toward the Worcester area. James Streeter, the sixth generation, married Susanna Alton of Thompson, Connecticut, which is just south of Worcester. We'll hear more about Thompson later. They got married in 1788, moved up to Whitingham, Vermont, which was just being settled at that time. And the area where they lived became known as Streeter Hill. There's a road that leads right from the center of town, right through that, right down into the town of Rowe. Most of that road is now abandoned, but uh, the hill and the road were named after that family. So they're buried in a cemetery not too far from that road. Uh, by the way, folks, I don't use this technique anymore of highlighting the gravestones with chalk for fear of damaging them. but. Uh, Back in 1988, I wasn't as uh, well-informed as I might be now. So they had a number of children. Their fifth child, third son, was also named James. And he married a lady named Sally Corbett from Rowe. The road really leads right to Rowe, so uh, obviously they knew each other being only a couple of miles apart. They were married in 1820. Now, her grandfather was Revolutionary War Captain Nathaniel Corbett, and he had a son, Moses, for whom Sally and James named their son, Moses. Now, they had seven children. Oh, first of all, let me show you uh, James and Sally. These are from original tintypes. The photos themselves are only about one inch tall. And there's the family group sheet. They had seven children. Uh, Hiram was their third child and their second son. He was born in Whitingham in 1825. Now here's an interesting story. In the winter of 1833, in other words, he's about eight years old, he and his older brother, Royal, you can see on that uh, chart there, Royal later became a deacon in the Whitingham Baptist Church. It's not like being a deacon in the Catholic Church today. It's a little different deal, but it was still a big deal in the day. Uh, but these kids are walking to school with their neighbor, Clark Jilson, and they're attending school in what was called the Kentfield District. They were struck by a blizzard. So they get out of school, and they're walking home in the storm about two miles through forest and over uh, tracks that they can hardly see because the blizzard is so heavy. So they had a great deal of difficulty finding their way. Fathers came out looking for them. 
Royal was the only one that had a coat. He loaned it to Clark, who was the littlest one. Likely saved Clark's wife. Clark became very ill afterwards. Now there's what I think is the schoolhouse, it still exists. It's on the Kentfield Road. And it's now called the Gillette School. It's <clears throat> privately owned. Uh, it's full of old furniture. Nobody ever uses it. 1845, we fast forward a few years. Clark Chilson and Hiram Streeter are grown up lads. They get together, they leave Whitingham to seek their fortunes. They walk 20 miles to Greenfield, stay overnight in a hotel, took a stagecoach to Worcester. Now Clark stayed in Worcester, became a mechanic, printer, became a judge, became the mayor of Worcester. And he was one of the founders of the Worcester Society of Antiquity, which is now the Worcester Historical Museum. He wrote all this stuff up as a little autobiography a few years before he died, and that's where I got all that information. The Society published that as a memorial to him in 1897 after he had died, and you can actually get it online, believe it or not, merely by Googling Hiram Streeter. <laughs> Who would have thought? <laughs> so, Clark gave the keynote address at the Whitingham uh, Centennial in 1880. He published a local history, Green Leaves from Whitingham, Vermont, in 1894, died a little later the same year. But in the meantime, in 1875, he gave an address at the 55th wedding anniversary of James and Sally Streeter. So that shows you just how close he remained to the family throughout his life. There's Clark Gilson. Hiram went into farming. He eventually owned a farm in Leicester, Worcester's neighboring town to the west. Married a lady named Caroline Merriam in 1847 in Auburn, and they had three children. 31st of December, 1863, Hiram goes down and signs up to join the 57th Massachusetts Volunteer Regiment, despite being discouraged from doing so by Clark Gilson and others. According to Clark Gilson, Hiram felt a strong sense of duty to his country, leaving his family, friends, and a pleasant home. His children were Frank, age 14, Ruth, age 13, and Willard, who was only two. Willard later went on to become a very prominent uh, Baptist minister uh, in Maine and New Hampshire. Okay, here's some uh, pictures of Hiram. Uh, the one on the left is in my possession. The one on the right, uh, a Civil War enthusiast bought off from eBay. It was a tintype in a CDB frame. Does everybody know what a CDB is? Carte de visite. People would hand them out, uh, you know, uh, obviously not in great quantities, but, uh, you know, like we would hand out uh, pictures today, or you know, today you take it on your cell phone, you email it to somebody, but uh, that, that was an early technique. Now, I want you to notice his uh, beard and how his hair sticks out above his ears. So he trained with the 57th Massachusetts in Company H. At that time, they had something called Camp Wool in Worcester. The new soldiers slept in barracks on hardboard platforms, wrapped in blankets. It must have been very cold in the winter. It's in January we're talking about. They drilled in marching techniques, stood guard duty, and learned other aspects of military life. Thursday, April 14th, the unit was reviewed and addressed by Massachusetts Governor John Andrew. They were entertained by a brass band and their regimental colors were presented. On Monday the 18th of April, the regiment composed of 928 men at that point left Worcester by train. They arrived down at Annapolis, Maryland and joined the 9th Corps. This is the 9th Corps insignia on the hat, uh, commanded by General Ambrose Burnside. Okay, there's Burnside. Anybody ever wonder where the, where the term sideburns came from? <laughs> from him. 
Ninth Corps marched to join General Ulysses S. Grant's Army of the Potomac, passing Manassas, camping at Rappahannock Station. You can see Rappahannock Station. I have no control over this thing. They were uh, encamped down in here. You have Manassas up here. Warrington that we'll talk about later is over here. Lee is off over in this area. You have the Rappahannock, the Rapidan rivers in between the armies. So on the 4th of May, Grant's forces, composed of nearly 120,000 men, crossed the Rapidan on pontoon bridges and marched into the wilderness. The beginning of the overland campaign of General Grant versus General Robert E. Lee's Army of Northern Virginia. 2016, my brother-in-law Jim Benoit and I undertook to follow the route of the overland campaign. One of my nieces just coming in, there's seats down front. <laughs> I loaded the audience, you know. <laughs> So, uh, let's take a look at the Overland Campaign. You can see how Grant's objective was to get between Lee and Richmond and cut off the army from defending Richmond. And meantime, there was another army coming up to attack Richmond from the south side. And hopefully he was going to get to attack it from the west. And Lee was a little too quick for him. If you note, in any of these maneuvers, Lee has the shorter route, plus he had the familiarity of the roads, and believe me, there weren't too many in that area. So as Grant would try to circle around to the left to get around Lee, Lee would meet him. They collided in the wilderness, uh, Spotsylvania Courthouse, the North Anna River, Cold Harbor, and ultimately Petersburg. And this kind of shows the same thing, but with a little bit more detail with modern route numbers. You'll note uh, Interstate 95 over here. Uh, you can note in some places Route 1, which was in those days called Telegraph Road. It's now called uh, Jefferson Davis Highway. Is that right, John? It certainly is. Okay. <laughs> so that gives you just a rough idea where all these uh, places are. Okay, now we get to the wilderness battlefield itself. The uh, Union troops coming in this way uh, from the Germana Ford on the Germana Highway. And you have your Brock Road here and your Orange Plank Road down here. And this, I believe, was the Orange Turnpike uh, in those days. Uh, if you go down there today, you'll find an enormous Walmart right about there. <laughs> this region with a little X in it that I'll talk about uh, later, you can't really get into here, the particular area of my interest in the battlefield, because that's a housing development. <laughs> but they've maintained a lot of it. This green area is, uh, is a park, part of the National Battlefield Park for Chancellorsville, Fredericksburg, and uh, the wilderness. So, at this stage, the Ninth Corps is in the rear of Grant's advance, and they're partially detailed to, gra to guard the uh, wagon train supplies. On the 6th of May, the 1st Division, which included the 57th Massachusetts, came down the Brock Road onto the Orange Plank Road. They were trying to help out Hancock, who had come in from the backside and was holding this area. And they got off onto a little side track, cart track through the woods, and got to somewhere in this position, which uh, was said to be about 10 feet from the enemy's trenches before they had to uh, turn back. They were advancing against uh, General A.P. Hill, for whom Fort A.P. Hill is named. It's not too far away from there. Now, Company H, the color corps that Hiram is a member of, is leading the charge. According to the regimental history, they succeeded in getting to the 10 feet, but they're challenged by the dense scrub forest, the undergrowth, uh, sharp brambles, 
Constant barrage of bullets, artillery fire, smoke, the woods catching on fire from all of this. So they're separated by terrain, vegetation, battle conditions. Their color sergeant leaped up on a stump. His name was Leopold Karpels. Waves the flag and calls for men, whatever units, by now they're all scattered and mixed, rally around the flag so they could resume their attack. But uh, they were forced back by a Confederate counterattack. Now, Sergeant, Sergeant Carples and several others, including Hiram Streeter, were surrounded by Confederate troops, but they were able to escape and hide in a ditch and underbrush to avoid being captured, crawling on their hands and knees back toward the lines. They later safely returned to the Union lines at the Brock Road, right around in this area with the colors and even a captured Confederate soldier. Sorry, John. <laughs> he, he'll get his chance later, don't worry. So for this act, Sergeant Carples received the Medal of Honor. That's what they gave it out for in those days, was saving the colors. Now he was the first person, the first Jewish person to be so honored. There's Sergeant Carples. He wrote up his memoirs, which became a part of the regimental history years later, and that's how we know he remembered the names of the guys that were with him, including Hiram Streeter. So I visited this battlefield in 2016, and there's a photo taken at the Widow Trap site, which, as you can see from the vegetation behind me, uh, notwithstanding the uh, housing development behind the vegetation, that's as close as I could get to it. So in the Battle of the Wilderness, 157th, remember they started with 928 men. They lost 252, about a quarter of their men, just in that one battle. Wounded, killed, captured, missing in action. So that battle was officially a stalemate. General Grant decided to try to circle to the left, as we just talked about earlier, and Lee marched on back roads, beat him to Spotsylvania Courthouse a few miles away, and was heavily entrenched by the time Grant got down there and was able to attack. Uh, that's where the bloody angle took place. Some of you have heard of that. But in spite of all of that, they weren't able to beat Lee in that battle either. The Ninth Corps was on the left side of Grant's forces, and they lost another 91 men that day. So now we're looking at going from the uh, Jackson Shrine. I assume you've been there, John. This is the house where Stonewall Jackson died after the uh, Chancellorsville battle uh, a year before, uh, all of the time we're talking about. The Union actually had some forces camped there, but they took this really roundabout route to get down to the North Anna River. Lee took the shorter route, basically Telegraph Road, and beat him to it. And again was heavily entrenched, but he, he was high up on a bluff, and there was very little room between the trenches going down the side of the bluff and the river. And he pointed right up onto the river, so the Union would have to divide its forces in order to attack him, and they'd have to cross the river twice in order to escape. So it was a pretty tough position. So on the, uh, the, the 57th arrived at the North Anna early in the stages of that battle. They had lost their previous commanding officer. And he was replaced by the now infamous, infamous often inebriated General James Hewitt Ledley. Anybody ever hear of him? Said to have been the worst general on either side in the entire Civil War. So, Ledley had them ford the river. Uh, he disobeyed the orders not to attack. And he was heavily under the influence. Okay, let's go get these guys. So off they go. Thunderstorm hits. They attack the strongly defended Confederate trenches and were repulsed. There's Ledley. And here's the map from the battlefield showing where that attack all took place. 
Union forces here, Confederate forces on the top of the ridge here with gun emplacements and everything, and your river over here. So the Union came up this way. Now if you zoom in on this a little bit, you can see 56th, 57th, 59th Mass, and two uh, regular U.S. Army units. All were repulsed. They were all under the 1st uh, Brigade, under the command of Ledley. So after they were repulsed, they went back to the river where they were able to encamp and uh, kind of lick their wounds for the night. You see the little X down here? You are here. Okay. I were there. <laughs> <laughs> So that's about, it. I don't think they even got that far if you look at the terrain uh, being there. And there's where they camp by the river. You can see it's kind of shallow at that stage. Uh, all the same, it wouldn't be a lot of fun to wade through that. Now this photo was taken, we don't know exactly when. Uh, some sources say it was taken right after the Battle of the North Anna. I know the men were issued new uniforms around that time from the history. Uh, I have thought for a long time this guy was Hiram Streeter, but I'm not so sure anymore. Another source says this was taken in July of 1865 after the war was over. They were issued brand new uniforms for marching in the uh, parade in Washington or whatever. So, photo, however, has become rather famous used on the uh, cover of this book by Warren Wilkinson, uh, Mother, May You Never See the Sights I Have Seen. And it goes into a lot of detail about the 57th Massachusetts. So, there's a painting which is on one of these signs in the battlefield. It shows the 57th, there's their colors uh, tacking up the ridge toward the uh, Confederate lines. And you can see a lot of them are falling uh, in the picture. So they again try to outflank Lee. The armies met again the next time down at Cold Harbor. Some of you have heard of that. Brings to mind a picture of a very chilly place where boats come in. That's not it at all. It was like a little tiny tavern where you could only get cold sandwiches back in the day. Who oh, no. knew? So Hiram was said by some sources to have been ill at the time of the Battle of Cold Harbor uh, and not to have taken part in it. Other sources say he was there. I don't know which to believe. The 57th played a lesser role, so they didn't encounter the tremendous slaughter that a lot of the units did, but uh, they still lost another nine men. So then Grant comes to an even more ambitious outflanking uh, maneuver. Without being detected by Lee, he moved the entire army down to Petersburg, an important railroad junction, Confederate supply line to Richmond. It's actually past Richmond on the south side. <laughs> on the 15th of June, Union soldiers attacked the thinly defended Confederate forces which staffed the Dimmock line which was a series of forts with gun emplacements, and they were all connected by trenches. The guns were all set up for overlapping fire and so forth, so uh, it was meant to be impregnable, which it wasn't, because it was very, very thinly defended at that point by just a few uh, boys and old men. The rest of the army is up fighting Grant at, uh, at Cold Harbor. So initially the Union had some success and captured uh, a number of the forces, uh, the forts on the north end of the line. Confederate forces retreated, dug a new series of trenches near what they call Harrison's Creek. The Union achieved more successes the following day, June 16th. And on the 17th, the 57th was still under the command of the incompetent and again inebriated Ledley and they attacked the Harrison Creek line at 8 o'clock at night. It wasn't quite dark, I guess, but it must have been almost. They rose up from their temporary shelter in a ravine, charged across a cornfield. Confederate cannons discharged uh, 
grape shot cannonballs at a low angle such that it would bounce and hit as many people as possible. And uh, in the midst of this charge, Hiram Streeter received a rifle shot through the head and was killed along with many others. Of the 186 officers and men that were fit for duty that day participating in that action, another 52 were killed, wounded, captured, or missing in action. One of those was a Lieutenant Edwin Coe, COE. Uh, he was killed, buried in the same cemetery as Hiram is. Lost his sword. Officers had swords, right? Sword was never heard of again for 150 years. This was on TV a few years ago. It showed up in a pawn shop in Hawaii. Oh. <laughs> How did it get there? Well, nobody knows. It's now in the possession of the Peter, uh, the Poplar uh, Grove Cemetery, uh, the National Park Service. I've, I've actually seen it twice. And uh, his great-grandniece was there uh, a couple of years ago. I actually got to meet her, and they had some family artifacts to display with it. So it was very impressive uh, to see that. OK, let's take a look. Uh, this shows the route going down around to uh, Cold Harbor. And this is the Petersburg uh, Battlefield Park map. The visitor center is now up in this area. Uh, Fort Lee, some of you have heard of that. That's over here, all government property. Uh, the crater that everybody's heard of is down in this area. It's the last stop on the tour. And this street coming out of the park is Crater Road. There's still a railroad running through here where there was a railroad uh, in 1864. Now, uh, Harrison's Creek is over in this area. And Confederate trenches were just across the creek in this area. And you can see a little bit more of that on this map. The creek, Confederate trenches, these were very hastily dug, so they weren't uh, very deep. Uh, the ravine from whence they charged and Ledley's uh, position noted there. There's another little stream here called Taylor's Branch. And uh, this, this is what remained, what, where the original Dimmock line was, which had now been abandoned by uh, the uh, 17th of June. Today there are stops along the Battlefield Tour Road and you can actually walk out next to these trenches and you can walk in from the other side and pretty much see where all of this took place. Although it's no longer a cornfield, it's a forest. As you can see there, that's as close to the spot as I could uh, figure. Uh, the ravines behind the hiking trail in front in Harrison's Creek, just the other side of the hiking trail. So the 16th of June is when my brother-in-law Jim Benoit and I hiked in to see this in 2016. So just as we take this picture, it starts thundering, it starts pouring, and we made our way back out. That somehow led us to believe we found the right spot. <laughs> so the following day, which was 152 years to the day after he was killed, we held a memorial service uh, on one of the hiking trails near to where the soldiers were originally buried. So over that following night, the Confederates fell back to a more defensible line and they remained entrenched in that line for the next nine months. And you know, people taking pot shots back and forth, uh, this mortar on the hat called the dictator, I mean, it fires cannonballs two feet in diameter into the city of Petersburg and this and that. And the guys had to sneak into their rifle pits in front of these trenches. Uh, they were kind of like the early warning guys in the units. Uh, what's the term, John? Oh. Scouting. 
pickets, I don't know, that's, there's another term, but they had to go in there at night, otherwise, and on a dark night, otherwise they'd get killed crossing in, and then they'd have to stay there all day. And couldn't have been a lot of fun. So, the remaining members of the 57th were placed on burial detail. They buried their fallen comrades on the field. Hiram's grave was marked by his friends with a wooden marker. That's an important fact, stated in a letter from the company surgeon to Hiram's widow, and it's preserved in his pension file. Today, the original burial, burial ground is near Tour Stop 3 in the Petersburg National Battlefield known as Meade's Station. So after the war is over, 1866, they get groups of men going shoulder to shoulder across the battlefield. And any time there's a suspected grave, a mound, or a depression, they'd stop, they'd investigate. Uh, if it was somebody who had fallen, they would dig them up, place them in a wooden coffin, and everybody was reinterred at the uh, Poplar Grove National Cemetery. It's one of the first national cemeteries. So there were over, actually it's about six, they say there's 6,718 graves at Poplar Grove Cemetery. It's now closed, you can't bury anybody else there. Only 2,139 are identified, only about a third. The rest of them are all unknowns. Hiram Streeter is fortunate to be one of those that was known because of that marker that his friends placed on his grave, which accompanied his coffin to uh, the cemetery. So 2011, I sent an email down to uh, Petersburg asking for any information about his grave, because I didn't know anything. And Ranger Ann Lumenschein answers me and says, oh yeah, we know where he is, grave number 432. And she explained this business about only one third being known. 17th of June, 2014, bless you. I couldn't get down there at the time. So I did the next best thing. I went out to Lester. And you go out there, you find his wife's grave. There's a memorial stone to him with a GAR marker. And it says, killed. Uh, Petersburg buried on the field and inside the Leicester Town Hall Paul and I talked about this kind of stuff because you got a similar thing with your memorial hall over here I imagine inside Leicester Town Hall this is all marble and the whole wall is covered with names and there's Hiram's and what happened to these guys these are all the fallen from uh, Leicester Two thousand sixteen, I'm down there at the battlefield, why not visit the cemetery? It's closed. Why is it closed? Oh, it's been closed for two years. It's gonna open next year. They had been trying for twenty years to get funding to refurbish it, and it was finally approved, so they got it. Uh, anyway, when they refurbished it, they put in all brand new headstones for everybody. Uh, and they're all upright headstones. Why wouldn't the headstone be upright? Well, they were originally. But the National Park Service took this over from the military in 1931. The first thing they did was, oh, gee, we want to make this easier to mow. Mm -hmm. So they pulled all the headstones out. They cut off the bottom half with nothing on it. Some guy built a barn out of those, and they put them all flush. Well, over the years they found out that wasn't such a good idea. The stones go up and down and, you know, they get nicked with a mower and they get sunken and you can't find them. And so anyway, they completely refurbished the whole thing, very, very carefully establishing where everybody was. And they reopened it two years ago on the 29th of April. So we left our names there. I was invited back by the National Park Service to attend that ceremony and it was very impressive. They did a fabulous job with that inviting a lot of the uh, family members and so forth to come. They even had a British uh, military attaché there. There's actually a British guy buried in there from World War I. That's a little weird. Well, he was down, uh, you know, teaching some of the uh, U.S. troops before they went overseas, and he felt sick and died, so, okay, there's a cemetery over here, so we'll bury him there. 
So the Brits came to honor him too, so that was nice. So I was, uh, here's uh, Hiram's grave that day. I'm probably the only family member that ever visited his grave. And here's the two park service rangers. There's Ann Blumenschein. And this is Betsy Dinger. She's adopted all of the guys in the cemetery as, as her own. They're her family. And uh, she just can't do uh, enough to uh, help out the cemetery. And about this time of year, they have a uh, uh, luminary memorial service. So while we were at Petersburg, we discovered that one of my companion, John Doty's uh, cousins, was from Hancock, Mass., Lieutenant Albert Doty, and he was also in the 57th. Now, he was instrumental in winning the Battle of the Weldon Railroad, which happened in August of that year. And there's his picture. And there's John and myself on the left, and John and my brother-in-law, Jim, over at the Weldon Railroad site, which is near to the Poplar Grove Cemetery. So one other footnote, we went to the Blandford Church and Cemetery. This is where all the Confederates are buried. Uh, it was right in back of that, the site where the crater is. So you can easily see why that, it was convenient to their side of the lines. A number of years after the war, the church was outfitted by the Confederate daughters with stained glass windows, one for every state in the Confederacy and each one is represented by a particular saint. All of those windows were created by Louis Tiffany. It's the only church in the country with all Tiffany windows. It's beautiful. They don't let you take pictures. I do have a booklet somewhere that shows it, but. Uh... So in the churchyard, though, in this cemetery, there's the grave of Nora Fontaine Maury. Uh, she's the founder of what originally was called Decoration Day in 1866. Now we know it as Memorial Day. And she placed grave, flowers on the graves of any of the soldiers. So now we'll turn to Moses Streeter, my great-great-grandfather. He was born in Whitingham, October 17, 1832. Educated in the academy on Town Hill when it was a new building. Building's no longer there, but there's a marker where it used to sit. So, 1853, he's teaching school. Uh, the newspaper clipping referring to that says Stanford, so I don't know where Stanford was, but probably Vermont, because it was like two towns away. 1857, he married a former neighbor uh, Fanny Bowen, and they lived in Thompson, Connecticut, where his grandmother was from. And he likely had cousins down there. And they lived in Worcester, and he worked as a house painter. They had no children, so she left him in 1861. He divorced her after the war in 1865. But in 1862, he joined the 18th Connecticut, which was formed in Thompson, he joined that in April. So the unit didn't do a heck of a lot at the beginning. They were mostly guarding around Washington and you know the lower Shenandoah Valley around Harper's Ferry and whatnot. But on June 13th to the 15th of 1863, they participated in the Battle of Second Winchester in Virginia. Now Lee and his forces pretty much steamrolled the uh, Union troops, but it helped to slow them down a little bit, so maybe helped uh, delay the uh, Confederates a bit so that the Union got up to Gettysburg uh, in time for that great battle there. It's debatable, but. So much of the 18th was killed, wounded, or captured. Uh, the ones that were captured were sent to Confederate prisons, including their commanding general. Now, Moses Streeter wasn't there. He was detailed on duty guarding Confederate prisoners off to the rear someplace. 1864, the pivotal year for these three guys. 
So Grant's strategy was to pr pressure the Confederate armies on all the fronts, which included the Shenandoah Valley in West Virginia and Virginia. He appointed a succession of Union generals to clear the Confederate troops out of the valley and to destroy the Confederate food supply. The War of Northern Aggression, right, John? Yeah. So they burned crops, barns, other buildings, uh, took the livestock and whatnot. So Fritz Seigel was the first general to try that. Uh, didn't work out too well. He was repulsed at Newmarket, came back up. This is where the uh, uh, cadets from uh, VMI come into play. Yep, you can visit the museum there. So Seigel, Seigel got fired, General David Hunter was appointed. There's David Hunter. Uh, most people in that general area on the southern side of things hate the name of David Hunter. <coughs> so he started up the valley the 26th of May. Initially he was very successful. But his orders were to cross the Blue Ridge Mountains, attack Charlottesville, and then Lynchburg, which was an important railroad junction. So by pressuring Richmond on the west side, it would have, you know, kind of put Lee in a vice, so to speak. Didn't work. Hunter decided to bypass Charlottesville, didn't cross the mountains, kept on going up the Shenandoah Valley. I say up because the Shenandoah flows from south to north. Uh, so he attacked several places, we'll, we'll see some mention of them later. But among other things, he burned much of Lexington, Virginia. Now Hunter was an adamant abolitionist. And anything that had anything to do with what he considered were southern traitors, whatever, he'd think nothing of burning their mansion, you know. Uh, the governor of Virginia burned his home in Lexington. But he also burned the VMI barracks. That's what it looked like the year after the war. Guess where my son-in-law went to school? <laughs> so a couple of years ago, I had to formally apologize to Mike because the regimental history says Moses Streeter was there as an ambulance driver. So he was there at the burning of the VMI barracks. And Mark's Mike said, oh, it probably needed burning anyway. So. <laughs> so Hunter's activities in destroying Confederate resources, homes, and institutions delayed his arrival at Lynchburg. This allowed Robert E. Lee to detach General Jubal Early over to Lynchburg to reinforce the few uh, forces that were defending Lynchburg. Just in the nick of time, they got there. So Hunter tested Lynchburg's defenses on the 18th of June. He was short on supplies, so he decided to retreat. And he went westward, all the way across West Virginia. It's a really roundabout route. It took him a couple of months. And nobody knew where he was in the meantime. That didn't please Grant in the least. So they eventually got back to Harper's Ferry with the aid of steamboats and trains. Let's take a look at that. Uh, coming up the valley, there was the Battle of Piedmont. The Union won that. Uh, Staunton, here's Lexington. Worked his way down, finally crossed over the mountains around in here, got up to Lynchburg, repulsed, or ran out of supplies, ammunition, decided to retreat all the way back across, all the way down by uh, what was then called Salem. I guess it's still there, but now the bigger town that wasn't there at the time was Roanoke. And they had a little skirmish at Hanging Rock and then hightailed it west, all the way across to West Virginia, till they got to Charleston, where they picked up steamboats all the way along the river by steamboats up to Parkersburg, and then they took the train back across till they get over to Harper's Ferry. 
So Moses Streeter talked about this saying, uh, on General Hunter's raid, marched 700 miles, participated in several bloody battles in 60 days. So Hunter's out of the way, so Jubal Early says, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm going to go back down the valley and start attacking stuff. So sure enough, he uh, takes back the entire Shenandoah Valley, crosses the Potomac, attacks locations in Maryland, Chambersburg, Pennsylvania, and threatened Washington, D.C. Some of you read about Lincoln standing on the parapets looking out at the Confederate troops. That's when that happened. Lee was thus enabled to, okay, I read that part. So Grant fired Hunter and replaced him with Major General Philip Sheridan, who was primarily a cavalry officer. August the 1st, so Sheridan reorganized the forces in the Shenandoah Valley as the Army of the Shenandoah and immediately started a counteroffensive. 13th of August, General, excuse me, Colonel John Singleton Mosby, we mentioned him a little while back, 300 of his rangers, they attacked the rear section of one of Sheridan's 600 wagon train uh, sections at a place called Berryville. So Mosby captures 200 beef cattle, that's good for the soldiers, five or 600 horses, 100 wagons, 200 soldiers. So Mosby was often known as the gray ghost because of the way that they functioned. They darted in and out, it was guerrilla tactics. It's a Confederate partisan cavalry unit called Mosby's Rangers. And they operated in and out of the Union lines pretty much at will. They loved to attack wagon trains. Officially, they were called the 43rd Virginia Cavalry Battalion, but the Union called it Mosby's Guerrillas. And the Union Cavalry was always trying to find them. There was a TV series about that back in the uh, 60s. You remember that? <laughs> it was all black and white, you know, at least on my TV. <laughs> okay, September 3rd, there's a battle at Berryville in spite of the fact that Sheridan lost a lot of his supplies. but So Moses Streeters with a wagon train, they pick up, uh, I think it was 150 or so wounded with 34 ambulances. It's a very unique number. You don't see that anywhere else. 34 ambulances. Bring the wounded back from Berryville, back up across the Potomac from Harper's Ferry to the hospital up there. Now they're scared of Mosby, so they asked uh, Sheridan personally if he could give them cavalry escort, and he said no, couldn't spare the men. So on the way back, they're getting really nervous. Uh, so they start back, they've got empty wagons, they go through Harper's Ferry over a place called Bolivar Heights, maybe some of you have been there. Uh, Moses really worried, he tears the lining of his cap just in case something happens and he needs to put his valuables in there. And they go through this place called Charlestown, Virginia, West Virginia. Not to be confused with Charleston, they're two totally different places, Charlestown, two separate words. This was the town where John Brown was tried and hung a few years earlier courthouse is still there, along with the wagon that they took John Brown to the gallows in and stuff like that. It's kind of cool to see that. Uh, so they're going through Charlestown. The rebel sympathizers there are taunting the drivers, you know, Mosby's around, you're never going to make it. They get about two miles south of town and sure enough, Mosby attacks the wagon train, gets in front of them and behind it as the men unhitch the horses, and Moses quickly turns, he stuffs his $80, which sounds like a large sum, you know, for those days, into the lining of his hat. So he manages to get on a, a team of horses and, and try to ride it into the woods, and Mosby's chasing after him with a revolver. Uh, he did manage to get off the horses, hide in the bushes, and then manage to sneak his way back to the Union lines later that night. They checked in at the uh, Provo Marshal's office, 
But then it's pouring rain. They managed to hide under a wagon for a while. It was getting cold, wet, and muddy. They finally found the sanitary commission, which offered them uh, some shelter and a hot meal. Okay, here's an 1852 map of what was then called Jefferson County, Virginia. A uh, couple of notable features, your Potomac River running along this way, your Shenandoah River running along this way. The meeting of the waters uh, is at Harper's Ferry. So they had crossed the river to deliver the uh, wounded to the hospital, climbed up over Bolivar Heights, up to a place called Halltown, and then over to Charlestown. You can see how big a place that was, even in those days. It was the county seat. It had These are actually blocks, and you can see these uh, streets today. And here's the turnpike that went out toward Berryville. If you follow the scale here, uh, about two miles takes you to about this spot, which I believe is roughly there. Uh, it beats the description. You can see two miles below Charlestown, we suddenly fell into an ambuscade. This was a point, very favorable to capture. On the east of the pike was a semicircle of about 50 acres of cleared land, belted by heavy oak woods, which came to the pike before and behind us. That's the only place I could find that looked like that at, at the two mile mark. So we are very carefully watching the odometer as we go along. You know? <laughs> OK, 1.3, 1.4. Uh, shortly up the road and across the street from this is now their big uh, regional high school. Uh, there's a lot of development around there. There's a bypass road that runs just past those trees, a four-lane highway. So after this all happened, Moses Streeter wrote back to his hometown newspaper. Uh, Danielson, Connecticut, which also covers Thompson. The article was published on the 29th of September. This took place on the 4th, so it's very contemporaneous. In the meantime, the Baltimore American published an article ridiculing uh, Sheridan for not providing a cavalry escort for the wagon train. Sheridan denied it ever happened. He said, oh, you know, that wasn't Mosby. The guys just panicked and ran off. Okay. Politics, fake news. <laughs> 155 years later, I find much evidence that it was Mosby, personally in command of the raid. I've still got sources to check. Okay, here's Mosby's picture, and there's Moses Streeter's description of him. Meets him to a T, I would say. So his account was contemporaneous and meets the description. All the pieces seem to fit. I found some evidence from some of Mosby's men that it happened. The fact that it's 34 ambulances is the only one of that uh, size wagon train. And why would he want to con contradict his commanding general? I don't know. Okay, so that was Mosby. Here's the uh, Harper's Ferry uh, Provo Marshal's office and describes what's supposed to happen there. There's the Provo Marshal of the day who gave us uh, passes for the day while we were there. You don't need those, they're just little souvenir things. But Here's the Mosby Monument at the Historical Society of Warrington, Virginia. Uh, that's the old jail in behind, which is their museum. Here's Mosby's house. He lived there for a number of years after the war. Actually became friends with Grant and was appointed uh, ambassador to uh, Singapore, I think it was. And there's Mosby's grave. So late in the afternoon, 12th of June, 2015, Jim and I are standing there. Start to, starts to thunder and starts to rain. Again. <laughs> so I said, okay, Colonel Mosby, how about 
<laughs> you and Moses Streeter give up this feud. <laughs> so a late, little later on, 1873, he wrote another account of the incident. It was published in the Greenfield Gazette and Courier. And he wrote a lot of other articles, uh, submitted his letters, letters to the editor or correspondent or whatever about the Civil War, Whitingham, and other things. One occasion he wrote that he marched over 2,500 miles, participated in 18 bloody battles in his three years of service. So winter comes along, they all go into winter camp near Martinsburg. And January of 1865, he's sleeping in an ambulance. That couldn't have been a lot of fun on uh, Washington Mall. So meets a journalist friend of his who invites him to the White House. And he went to the White House that night and met President Lincoln. So after the war, he returned to Western New England, lived in Charlemont, Mass, November 1865. Remember, he got divorced earlier that year, but in November he marries a lady from East Providence, Rhode Island, named Martha Sweet, who is my great-great-grandmother. Their daughter, Alice, is my great-grandmother. She was born in 1867. Uh, they had a son, Theodore Clinton Streeter, was born in October 1869, and Martha died the following April. So here's this little baby. Uh, he ends up going back to live with aunts and so forth, and relatives in uh, Providence. So the third time, November that year, Moses still has a young daughter, and he remarries November 1870 to a lady named Martha Heath, or Martha Elmer, rather, of Heath. And they had seven children. He apparently liked the name Martha, I don't know. But <laughs> <coughs> So here's where they lived in Charlemont. This photo was taken probably mid to early 1870s. Here's Moses sitting on the porch, my great-grandmother Alice, and some of her younger half-brothers and sisters. Uh, the house is still there today. I'm pretty sure that's the same house. I'll get to that one. Let me back up just a bit. So, he apparently suffered from a bit of boredom or desire to move west, whatever. 1878, he decides to move his family west to northwestern Kansas. First, when he got out there, they loved the land. He wrote these glowing descriptions back to the paper of all the crops they could raise and this and that and the other thing. Uh, how much he could get per acre and all of this. They lived in a sod hut, I guess, at the time. But September 30th of that year, there's an Indian raid. Cheyenne Indians, 19 of the fellow settlers in that area were killed. Now Martha and the children were in a ravine picking berries, so you know they were able to hide in there, and they were okay. But she and Moses helped to bury the, uh, the fallen settlers afterward. <coughs> So this was the last Indian raid in Kansas, led by Chiefs Little Wolf and Dull Knife. His names probably don't sound too familiar, but you could read the book, Bury My Heart at Wounded Knee, and there's a whole chapter about that. They were kicked out of the Dakotas, sent down to Oklahoma. They were sick and starving on the reservation, so they wanted to go back to the Dakotas, so that's where they were headed. So this area is now near the town of Oberlin. Decatur County, Kansas. And they have a monument, which was put up in 1911. And all the uh, fallen settlers are buried around the base of the monument. And there's the museum that they have for this whole episode. So we think the Indian raid discouraged him because he came back east, went back to his hometown, Whitingham. And they lived in this house, which is still there. And there he is, uh, probably around 1901 or two, with uh, some of his children, one of the spouses, youngest child, Benny. 
And you remember that old schoolhouse from earlier? There it is in the background yeah. right there. You never moved too far from home. So he uh, joined the Grand Army of the Republic, which was the H.O. Gillette Post 109. Wrote more newspaper articles, essays, and poetry. Did odd jobs for the town and others. Died in Whiningham in 1905, and is buried with his third wife, Martha, in the Sadaga Cemetery, along with their daughter, Jenny, and son, Floyd, that had uh, predeceased them. And you note the GAR marker, post 109, on his grave. Following year, three of his sons moved to California, fulfilling his dream of moving west. Benny, being the youngest one, became a very successful dairy farmer in uh, Sonoma. So we'll talk about Joseph now, the last of the three brothers we're going to talk about, was born in Whitingham, September 7, 1836. Married a lady named Lucy Caroline Baker from Reedsboro in 1856. They had three children, William Cowher, Caroline, Highland and Gertrude. So here's Joseph and his daughter Lillian. <coughs> Lillian's great-granddaughter is a librarian in uh, Seattle, Washington. So Joseph was reluctant to enter the army, likely due to having a wife and two children during the Civil War. Now, he was known as being drafted, paid that $100 commutation, which was quite a bit of money for folks, I would imagine. But his son Highland died in August of 1863. So for whatever reasons, he goes down to Brattleboro and enlists on the 19th of December, mustered in at Brattleboro on the 15th, uh, 5th of January as replacement Company B, 8th Vermont Volunteer Regiment. Came home for a few days, got his affairs in order, reported for duty 17th of January. They took them down to tr by train to New Haven, then by steamboat to New York, then by ship down the eastern seaboard around Florida, and over to New Orleans on the 10th of February, then to Franklin, Louisiana. And he and other replacement troops joined the prior members of the 8th Vermont and started their training. Received the rifles March the 1st, started drilling. Unit drilled, stood guard duty, saw little action during that time. He wrote home, received a lot of letters. July the 6th, okay, things aren't going so well with this overland campaign. They need more men because they've lost untold tens of thousands already. So they transfer the 8th Vermont back up to the Washington area. So again, they go back by ship around Florida. He writes in his diary, sick on the sea uh, for several days, you know. They go up the Potomac River to Georgetown. And then the unit moved back and forth across the Potomac between Virginia and Maryland. On August 3rd, he met his brother, Moses, near Frederick, Maryland. Met Moses again August 18th near Berryville and again on the 26th near Halltown. I put this together, which is probably going to drive you nuts because it's a very busy slide, but the red lines show his movements from Georgetown back and forth and all over the place, getting as far up the Shenandoah Valley as Mount Crawford at one point. Uh, the X's in red are where they camped the X's in yellow that you can hardly see are where he met his brother Moses. A total of uh, seven times, I think. Key battles would be Berryville, we talked about, Third Battle of Winchester, 19th of September, uh, Cedar Creek, 19th of October. So essentially, they start at Berryville, they drive the Confederates back at Winchester, chase them all the way back down the valley to Mount Crawford and say, okay, they aren't coming back again. So they retreat back to Cedar Creek and encamp there. So several times he saw his brother Moses, I mentioned. Uh, my guess in all of this was that he marched about 500 miles with all these red lines going back and forth. Mm -hmm. 
close as I can come to it. You wear out a couple of pairs of shoes that way, I would think. So, Tuesday, October 18th, Joseph writes in his diary, in camp at Cedar Creek on guard today. Jubal early wasn't through yet. So that night, early moves his troops past this area here, which is called Massanutten Mountain. If any of you have ever seen it, it's seriously a Massanutten. It's just a big, huge, huge rock. They managed to muffle their movements and attack the Union troops before dawn. Well, a lot of them are still sleeping. Joseph writes, the Rebs made an attack about daylight rather surprised us. I was wounded about sunrise, was taken prisoner. But the good Lord gave us the victory and was taken back by our boys after sunset. So the Battle of Cedar Creek was originally a stunning Confederate victory. The 8th Vermont was attacked at the outset, as Joseph describes, and as best I can determine, was camped about this area. This map was is supposedly at, at 5.30 in the morning at the outset of the attack. They managed to get across the turnpike and hold off some of the Confederate forces for a while while the rest of their buddies basically retreated. Now this is right today at about the intersection of Interstates 81 and 66 in Middletown, Virginia. Some of you have been there, I think. So there's a monument for the 8th Vermont's action on the spot. Herbert Hill was a veteran who uh, donated that. It was dedicated uh, in 1885. So they lost 110 of the 164 men there, including three flag bearers that were shot down in turn. The monument was rededicated three years ago by the Park Service. So in a famous action described in the poem, Sheridan's Ride, General Field Sheridan, who had been conferring with Grant way in the rear, heard cannon firing on his ride back to his troops, put his horse Rienzi into a gallop, rallying his retreating troops on his way, succeeded in reorganizing the Union forces, driving the Confederates back south up the Shenandoah Valley for good. The 8th Vermont played a solid role in this late day action recovering their lost campground and fallen comrades, as Joseph related. There's Sheridan. There's a painting of Sheridan's ride. Highly uh, uh, instilled with artis artistic license, I would say. And here's an earlier painting from uh, a book 1885, I guess. Uh, turn, boys, turn, we're going back. So that was a pretty famous incident. Uh, Rienzi still survives, by the way, in a manner of speaking. He's stuffed and in this museum in Washington. <laughs> so anybody can go down there and see him. So Jim Benoit and I went there in 2006. They preserved a lot of open space around the battlefield. Some of you may have stopped there. But this little white blob in the back is a now much expanded quarry. So all of these battlefields are under tremendous pressure for development. So the Battle of Cedar Creek essentially ended the Confederate presence in the Shenandoah Valley with the destruction of crops, livestock, and barns, much of the food supply to the Confederacy was cut off, contributing to the end of the war the following April. The victory at Cedar Creek also contributed in a major way to Lincoln's reelection. The 8th Vermont considered the battle one of their finest hours. A mural depicting the battle, painted by Julian Scott in 1874, is prominently displayed in the State House uh, capital of Montpelier, Vermont. And they also have the 
8th Vermont Regimental flags, national and state flags, both. Joseph was out of action, wounded. First he was moved by ambulance to Newtown, then to Winchester, then to Martinsburg, and was never moved out of the ambulance until he arrived at Martinsburg at 2 p.m. on October 22nd. That's three days later. That must have been pretty painful, you would think. He was then transferred by train to Baltimore, and then he was in Patterson Park Hospital on the 23rd of October. And there's a picture of Patterson Park Hospital. There is now a Patterson Park, but no more hospital. Now, on this diary page, you, whoops, you know General Phil, Phil Sheridan in ink. For quite a while, I thought that was Sheridan's signature, but I don't think so anymore. It's a different hand than he would have had, but it's not Joseph's hand either. So he was in Baltimore in the hospital for several weeks. Then they moved him by train north on the 22nd of November. So in Brattleboro, he was, he was there for Thanksgiving and able to celebrate and have Thanksgiving dinner. They took him up to Montpelier the following day to a hospital up there. So he closed out the year in the hospital. From his pension application, he suffered a debilitating wound in the ankle, resulting in his left foot being twisted at 120 to 130 degrees, and the foot locked downward. So he's essentially crippled for the rest of his life. There's a doctor's note uh, from a pension file talking about that. <clears throat> was in a terrible amount of pain a lot of the time. His wife, Caroline, died in 1896. He married her sister for, for his second wife. She died in 1908. He married for the third time and later that year. And he died in Reedsboro, Vermont in 1915, living most of his life in Reedsboro. So he and his first wife, Caroline, are buried in the Arms Cemetery in Shelburne Falls, Mass. Along with uh, his daughter's family is, is how that all happened. It took me a few years to find where he was buried. So, <clears throat> so that brings uh, this presentation to a close. So I've been to the battlefields in Virginia, West Virginia, where these guys met with fate. The suffering of all the participants in this war is unfathomable, really. The official count at one point was that over 700, excuse me, 600,000 men died. These days they say it's closer to 750,000 people. So it's an epic struggle. Uh, we can only embrace this sort of spirit today. This is a little sculpture in a place called Cockeysville, Maryland. Beth knows where it is. Near the hotel where we stay, we go down there usually uh, every August. So there's a fellow named Tom Ledoux who wrote a book uh, 2011, and he lists 168 soldiers credited to this little tiny town of Whitingham. They were either born in, came from Whitingham, served in the war, or were buried there. And Hiram Streeter is not on that list, so there's probably more. And all these little towns have similar stories. So I'd like to thank all those who've helped in providing this information, starting with my late grandmother, Florence Page Morse, the late curator, Carol Lee, from the uh, Whitingham Historical Society, the National Park Service Rangers, Ann Blumenshine and Betsy Dinger, my streeter cousins, Judy Keller Fox of Portland, Oregon, and Gail Grant Park of Seattle, Washington, Reverend Doug LaPlante for his help with the Petersburg Prayer Service for Hiram, my friend Doug Parkhurst, whose great-great-grandfather was a member of the 56th Massachusetts, served alongside these guys, was captured at the crater and died in Andersonville in an unmarked grave. Just another one of those 750,000. I'd also like to thank my battlefield traveling companions, brother-in-law Jim Benoit, my friend John Doty, uh, the guys from the Historical Society here, Paul Godin, Charlie Tebbets, and Jim Loibel. 
and my good friend Paul O'Sullivan, who uh, arranged this little get-together. All who helped in organizing and setting up for this presentation, and my wife Beth, who suffers through it all. <laughs> I'd also like to thank the VFW, the Boy Scouts, and any folks who are out there putting flags on veterans' graves for Memorial Day. I can't begin to tell you how important these flags are for the relatives of the fallen veterans <clears throat> who gave their lives for the greater good of the country. Now, when they place the 37,000 or whatever it is flags on uh, Boston Common on Memorial Day, I'm happy to think that Hiram Streeter is among those. So thank you very much, and I'll entertain any questions. John. Ron, I just think one thing's very important to be said. You know, when people talk about brother against brother during the Civil War, and mainly that came out of this area where you're talking about, mm -hmm. because West Virginia being a, a child of the Civil War, they, they, they were allowed to secede uh, from Virginia, where Virginia was not allowed to secede from the Union. They became a state, and there were 20, 20, 24 regiments that fought for the North in West Virginia, and there were 27 regiments that fought for the Confederacy, and they had to fight under the Army of Northern Virginia under Lee, because they could not fight as an Army of West Virginia, because West Virginia was considered a border state, i.e. Northern state, although we know it's really a Southern state. but. It's, it was really terrible because there were a lot of families there. And, and I, I grew up in West Virginia, and, and you meet people today who still talk about, well, that traitor cousin of mine, you know, he, he fought for the Yankees or whatever. And, and, and it's really a tragic history. But in 19, I, I'm going to say 54, I may be wrong, the Confederate soldiers were made American veterans. So they, they were honored as well as past veterans. It's good to know. John's our resident expert on uh, West Virginia. So. Everything West Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> and we have some very interesting discussions in some of our Knights of Columbus meetings, oh, don't yeah, we, John? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, the war of northern aggression, as John likes to say. Uh, any other questions? Thank you. I think I've uh, kind of run over here. Oh, one in the back. For Gillette House. Yeah. Which I know this is not in, in the Civil War. So Gillette, going back to the, the Civil War era, how, yeah. is that, does that, how does that transport up to Gillette State? I don't know. There could be a family connection. Sweet. I've never researched it. There was a prominent family named Gillette that lived there. And in fact, Moses Streeter in the last year of his life uh, had a legal agreement that they would take care of him in their home. Uh, that house still exists. All those houses are still there, for the most part. That little town of Whiting Ham. Interesting. Oh. And the, there's not a lot of development uh, around there. My wife tells me to shut up. Does anybody else have anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. We wish everybody a very happy Thanksgiving and holiday season. And our next meeting will be on March 24th. Does any cookies left help yourself on the way out? I was there when the lion came down the hallway. Okay. I have a picture on my phone. Oh,